Good Friday morning. Welcome back to Begin the Word. Today we look at Romans chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Well, the Bible says, Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means! Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For how then could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, Their condemnation is just. Of course, we want to place this within the overall context of what's going on here in the book of Romans, in particular the first three chapters. We come now to here to this seventh point in our outline, that God is faithful in spite of the faithlessness of the Jewish nation. Of course, this is going to culminate later in the chapter with the great revelation of the righteousness of God. But before we get to that, we have to talk about the faithfulness of God his ability to keep his promises. And that's what Paul is addressing here in this chapter. He starts out by asking this question that he does not answer, not at least in this text. He says, what is the advantage of the Jew? And this is the natural question flowing out of Romans chapter 2. Remember, Romans chapter 2 is to show us that Jews suffer the same fate ultimately as Gentiles. They are under the judgment of God because of sin. And if The fate of the Jew and the fate of the Gentile are the same. The natural question is, what advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? Because Paul just got done saying, if you're circumcised, but you don't obey the law, then you're the same as an uncircumcised person. And the same is true for a Gentile. If they obey the precepts of the law, they are just like a Jew, a member of the covenant. So what is the advantage of the Jew? What is the value of circumcision? He simply states here, much in every way, and he says, first of all, or to begin with, and this Greek word here implies the first of many, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were given the law. They were entrusted with the burden of receiving the law and preserving it through the generations. And that's a great blessing. That's a great advantage. That gave them insight into what God wanted. Now, Paul does not go on to enumerate all of the blessings, all of the advantages that Jews had. He comes back to this idea in Romans chapter 9, starting in verses 4 and 5, where he speaks to this more directly. But until then, he just simply says, there are many advantages. He says, much in every way. There are many advantages that the Jews had because they were God's covenant people. But then he asks the pointed question, the question that Romans 2 also begs of us. What if some were unfaithful? What if the Jewish nation who had received the oracles of God, what if they broke God's law? In fact, he just got done saying that in Romans chapter 2. The Jews broke God's law, and they are under the same curse as the Gentiles. What if some of God's people were unfaithful? Does their, the Jewish nation, does their faithlessness nullify God's faithfulness. Now, we have to say something about the Greek of this phrase, the faithfulness of God. It is, in my opinion, that Romans 3, 1 through 8 is a key that unlocks much of Romans chapter 1 through 3. Much of the meaning is contained here in Romans 3, 1 through 8. Much of Paul's argument turns on what happens here in Romans 3, 1 through 8, in particular, the first half of this passage. Does Jewish faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? The Greek here is literally the piston to theu. That is literally saying the faith of God. Faith of God. The to theu of the Greek is a genitive phrase, so faith of God. This is important because sometimes we'll see the, the phrase in the Greek, faith of Christ. And many English translators want to translate the genitive phrase of Christ to mean faith in Christ. But it is clear here that Paul is not referring to the faith that we have in God, but he is talking about God's own faithfulness. 
And the word faith often carries more in its meaning than simply belief. And that's true even in English. We say someone acted in good faith or a husband was faithful to his wife. The word faith here carries with it much more than belief. And that is certainly the case here. And nearly every translation points that out about this word. Does the faithlessness of the Jewish nation nullify God's faithfulness, that is God's righteousness, his covenant promises. Remember, God promised to Abraham that through his seed, that is through this nation, all the earth would be blessed. But what if that very nation was faithless? Does that undo the redemptive scheme that God started in Abraham and continued through the Jewish nation? Well, the answer is obvious, by no means. Let God be true. Let his promises stand, though everyone were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. There seems to be a fear, an understandable fear, that Jewish unfaithfulness would undo God's covenant promises. And there would be every reason based on the law alone for a Jew to think this. Isn't that what Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 11 through 20. Isn't that what that's about? Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 20 is about the idea that if the Jews sin and turn against God, they're going to be under a curse. The law explicitly stated that God's promises to Israel were contingent on their obedience. You break the law, you fall under the curse. And so the natural question is, if the Jews were faithless, as Paul has just charged in Romans chapter 2, does that undo the promises of God? Does that undo his promise to save and redeem man? Or has the scheme of redemption fallen on its face? He says in verse 4, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. This is a fascinating quote. This comes from a passage we read all the time. Psalm 51 in particular, this comes from verse 4. Psalm 51, verse 4, David says, Against you alone I sinned and did evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Now, there's a difference in Psalm 51 and 4 in the Hebrew text and then the Greek text for the Septuagint. The Greek text states what Paul says here, that God may prevail when he is judged, putting God in the seat that you may prevail when you are judged, whereas the Hebrew speaks of God being blameless when he judges others. But Paul here is quoting the Septuagint, and that's very important in understanding the flow of his argument. Is it right for us to speak of God as the one who is being judged? Some translators of English have really struggled with this, and they have tried to argue that this phrase, you are judged, should be translated as when you contend judiciously. The NIV tries to go that way, and that is just not what the Greek is saying. This is quite clearly stating that God may be justified in his words, and when God comes under scrutiny, he may prevail. In a sense, Paul is saying that God is on trial. God's faithfulness is under question. He is under scrutiny, and the Bible teaches it very clearly that when God comes under this type of judgment, he will prevail. By no means, let God be true, though everyone were a liar. And how uncomfortable it might make us doesn't change the fact that that's what Paul is saying. We cannot escape the implication that God himself is coming under the criticism of others, wrongfully so, but perhaps understandably so. And here's the conundrum. If God punishes the world for disobedience because they were in fact faithless, he would be unfaithful to his promise to redeem mankind. And yet simultaneously, if God redeems mankind, he would be unfaithful to his promise to punish wickedness. And Paul turns to that next. He says, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? By no means, of course, God is going to judge us. And the word us here probably refers to the Jews that God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on the Jews? Of course not. If God couldn't inflict wrath on the Jews, how then could God inflict wrath on the world, the Gentiles? Of course God is going to judge the world. And so we have this conundrum. Is God going to save humanity or is God going to punish humanity? What a problem for the Bible-believing Jew to have. Is Deuteronomy 30 
true when it talks about the curse coming upon God's chosen people? But what about Genesis 12 or even back in Genesis 3 where God promises that he will defeat Satan? How is this going to unfold? How could this be? And Paul has a glorious solution to this problem. But not yet. We'll come to it next week. Paul here in verses 5 through 8 gives these hypothetical statements. Someone may come along and say that God is unjust to inflict righteous wrath upon us. Someone might also come along and say, well, if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Someone might say, why not do evil that good may come? It's important to know that these various phrases here, these various questions that are being asked are not Paul's questions. These are hypothetical questions a Jew might ask when confronting the reality of God's righteousness and faithfulness. They might say that, well, God couldn't judge us. He can't judge us. He promised to save us. They might say that, well, if my lie abounds to God's glory, then I can't be condemned as a sinner. Or why not just keep sinning so that good may come? Because God's going to be faithful to redeem us in spite of the fact that we've been faithless. My faithlessness did not cancel God's faithfulness. And because of that, they might wrongfully think that I can go on sinning. Of course, Paul's going to come back to that idea in Romans chapter 6. He doesn't really answer it for here, but he leaves it up to our common sense to know that that's a slanderous charge. And of course, that is not true. Stick with us. Come back next week. I can't wait to get to the conclusion of Romans chapter 3, where Paul explains how it is whenever God comes under scrutiny that he prevails. And boy, does he prevail victoriously. Thanks for joining us today on Beginning the Word. It's my hope that just as you have begun today in the Word of God, you will live out today in the Word of God.